you know, when, you, when you get involved in alumni volunteer activities, one of the best things about it is you meet neat, interesting people. And about a year ago, a year or more ago, uh, uh, Eric and some people said, you, you got you to talk to Kelly Kleinman. She's interested in the program. So I set up time to talk to Kelly. I started giving Kelly my spiel about UC Pitt. I got a sentence out, maybe a paragraph out, and she says, I'm in. Now, I didn't know what that meant, but I knew my pitch was over. So, so over the course of time since then, I found out what that meant when she said, I'm in. I mean, Kelly is uh, 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 all the UC Pitt board meetings she comes to, great ideas, everybody talks. Kelly's got a wonderful board member. Finding placements, looking for placements all over the place, wonderful in terms of that whole thing. The support of the program has been just absolutely outstanding. And it all came from, I'm in. So, so that shows you what kind of commitment. It's a really big deal. Really, very much appreciate it. A, a little bit of the biography of Kelly. She's a graduate of the college, also of the law school, double alum. Uh, I think since the law school, have you done any legal work at all? I practiced law for three whole years. Okay, so that's... that's <laughs> that was three years too many, but <laughs> Since then, it's been a variety of things. Now Kelly has a... It has a consulting organization that does nonprofit consulting. It consults with nonprofits about their board strategies, fundraising, a variety of things, very much in the nonprofit area. And then also the other thing about Kel that I'll mention is that if you listen to the local public radio station and you hear dueling critics, this is one of the dueling critics. So 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 so, so Kelly does a lot of stuff in terms of nonprofits, and 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 we heard this nonprofit 101 a preview of it last year. And it was so good we had to do it again. So, Kelly, if you can take us through nonprofit one more. Thank you. I, I really appreciate everybody's coming out because it really is such a horrible night. My, my thought is to talk for a little while because I can never resist talking for a little while. <laughs> and then opening it up to whatever anybody wants to talk about. When I did this a year ago, it was at the very beginning, it wasn't a year ago, it was 18 months ago, it was at the very beginning of the fellowship year, and I was trying to give brand new fellows a sense of what the nonprofit community was like. And the consensus seemed to be that this was the kind of thing you could appreciate a little bit better once you've been in the nonprofit community for a while, hence our decision to do it now. On the other hand, the risk of that is that you already know everything that I'm going to say. So if you already know everything I'm going to say, try to keep the yawns to a minimum because my little feelings get hurt easily. Some of you, oh, the other thing I should say is, you know, Tom really hyped this as like this big hilarious thing. <laughs> you know, it's only hilarious if you think that the way the nonprofit community operates is hilarious, which it actually is. You know, it doesn't make any sense at all. And so I decided, given that I had gotten all this hype and needed to do something that was at least faintly amusing, to put on this uh, lanyard, which some of you may have noticed. It says, ask me about my vow of silence. <laughs> and the reason that I'm wearing this is that it is indicative, as far as I'm concerned, of practically everything that happens in the nonprofit community, which is that somebody asks you to do something impossible or counterproductive or pointless pretty much every day. And there are reasons for this. And so what we're going to do, what I'm going to do tonight, I hope, is to sort of back off to 30,000 feet, which is an expression Tom likes to use, and take a look at why it is that the sector operates the way it does. And then we can talk about how that, that has an impact on you guys and what it is that you're finding difficult or satisfying or whatever about the nonprofit community. First things first, you're working in a sector of the economy that has its own traditions, its own rules, its own systems. And I mention that, I mean, on the one hand, of course. On the other hand, one of the things that you hear in the nonprofit community a lot is we should operate more like a business. We should operate more like other sectors of the economy. And I am here to assert to you that nonprofits operate in their own ways and for reasons that are completely appropriate. So you're coming in, it's as though you're being um, rushed for a fraternity. You're coming into an environment 
that has its own regulations and symbols and things that you have to do. Now, one of the things that you have to do in the nonprofit community is keep a straight face when people tell you a lot of nonsense. So if there's anything that you don't like tonight, consider it practice for that activity. <laughs> um, I've been, I mean, just to, to bring the, the background a little bit, I have had my own consulting practice advising charities about how to organize themselves better and raise mo more money for more than 20 years. And in the course of that, I've worked with education organizations, I've worked with social service agencies, with advocacy groups, with hospitals, I mean, really, you name it, across the board, lots of higher education stuff, lots of uh, environmental stuff. And I say all that because not a single one of those organizations would have said, at least at first blush, I am a nonprofit. What they say is, I'm a hospital, I'm a university, I'm a, a youth services organization. And what that means is that nonprofits are much less likely to think to themselves, uh, how are the problems that we're experiencing also experienced by other people in the sector? Because they very rarely think about it as the sector. It's only in the last 20 years that the profession that I'm in, the nonprofit consultancy, has started to be considered anything other than people who don't have jobs. And so you really need to go out and, and persuade nonprofit organizations that there are unique things about the way they're managed that need particular kinds of attention. And this background is you know, something that you guys need and are probably already figuring out in the course of your job. So the nonprofit sector, here's the obvious stuff. One of the three pillars of the economy alongside government and business. And then the sector itself is further divided, and I think this is important because there are what I think of as the business style nonprofits. That's the hospitals and the universities. They are in some ways completely indistinguishable from big business of all kinds. They're not actually indistinguishable. For example, their property is tax exempt, and we're going to talk about that after a while. But they operate like businesses, they have the necessary resources, they're dealing with millions or billions of dollars. And then there are the smaller, and I gently say more eccentrically managed, <laughs> organizations, which includes arts groups and advocacy groups. And then social service agencies tend to be in between. So you've got social service agencies like Metropolitan Family Services, which is like the University of Chicago. It serves thousands and thousands of people and has a budget in the millions. But there, <clears throat> excuse me, there are also social service agencies like the one I was working with today, which is a youth organization in Uptown. Serves a lot of people, but does it you know, a day late and a dollar short. And lately, as many of you probably already know, a dollar short is really the point, because many of the social service agencies are dependent on state funding, and state funding is not forthcoming. And it's not just that they can't get grants to do wildly innovative programs. It's that they can't get paid for doing things they've already done, like providing foster care for children or you know, placing children in adoptive homes. And that's one of the things that's the most important about the nonprofit sector in general, or at least what I call the charity part of the nonprofit sector, the smaller organizations. They do things that sometimes are completely incomprehensible unless you remember that their problem is they don't have enough resources. People say that nonprofit organizations, and when I say people, you know, there are business people who say, nonprofit organizations are just so inefficient, you know, they make stupid decisions. I would argue that they are inefficient the way poor people are inefficient. That is, a poor person will go to the store and buy the small size of something, even though the unit price is less if they buy the big size. Well, why do they do that? Because they don't have resources. The option to buy the big size is not necessarily available to them. Take that and magnify it about 800 times, and you have the nonprofit community. Nonprofit organizations do things more slowly, they sometimes do things inefficiently. They don't bring on all the staff that they need. They don't use all the resources that are available to them. And every single one of those things comes back to not having enough money. And that's something that I think all of us need to keep in mind when we hear rhetoric, and we often hear it, about the way the nonprofit sector is going to make up for things that the government no longer wants to do, that the government can no longer pay for 
let me assure you, first of all, that a huge chunk of the nonprofit sector, at least 50% and probably more, consists of government contractors. They literally do not exist unless they get government payment. They are doing things the government is prepared to pay for, but not to do itself. And that includes, you know, foster care and a range of other, of other um, practices. In addition, Every single nonprofit out there spends all of its time, and I'm sure you guys have noticed this by now, on its knees to prospective donors. And no matter how generous the donors are, there are always five places to put every dollar. So the notion that the nonprofit community will somehow miraculously be able to take over feeding all the people who might get cut off of food stamps or housing all the people who might not get Section 8 vouchers to get housing or all of the other things that we can think of that the government does, educating all the people who can't afford to get educated, is nonsense. And I say that because the most frustrating thing about working in the nonprofit sector is knowing that you're being asked to do something that is vitally important that you don't have the resources to do right. And so there's always the question whether you do it the best you can for a smaller number of people or sort of half acidly for a larger number of people. And those are questions that every executive director faces every day. Now what I would argue is there are distorted patterns of decision making in nonprofits because of this lack of resources. Now isn't this hilarious? Don't you guys think this is a riot? Um, what, who makes the decisions will often vary from project to project or even from minute to minute. And that's partly because decision making follows the money. So if there's a nonprofit agency that has one program that has regular funding and another program that has to beg its funding every single year, the person with the regular funding will have more weight in decision making and will be more likely to get what he or she needs to run the program. Uh, that you know is a is a nonprofit example of them who has gets and success breeds success and so on. The poorer you are, the harder it is to raise money. And one of the first things I had to learn when I came into the sector is that if you say to a prospective donor, "You should give me money because I don't have enough," uh, you're a loser. What you have to say to a prospective donor is, "You should give me money because I can solve your problems and I can do it." <coughs> more efficiently or in a smarter way or with University of Chicago PIP fellows or whatever it might be that nobody else can do. So what people are interested in who rely on the nonprofit sector to do advocacy and education and preservation of cultural history and production of plays and all of the things that we ask charities to do, what people are looking for is the innovative, the efficient, and the inexpensive way to get those things done. What this means is that if you have acute resource constraints, you're going to make stupid decisions. You're going to decide to buy the small size. You're going to decide that you can't spend money on fundraising or marketing because, hey, you don't have any money. But any business person will tell you, you've got to spend money to make money. So lots of my <coughs> clients say to me, you know, nobody knows who we are. We are the best kept secret in the Chicago metropolitan area, and I've literally had 45 organizations say that. I assure them that they are not the best kept secret, because I've already worked with the best <laughs> kept secret. But the reason that they're not known, and therefore the reason they have difficulty raising money, is that they're not prepared to invest money in going out and um, running an advertising campaign or even in reaching out to individuals and encouraging those individuals to reach out to their friends to reach out to their friends. Um, what nonprofits are concerned about is using their resources to support their clients, whether their clients are audience members or students or you know, people with drug addiction. And it's very easy in the nonprofit sector to think, I cannot possibly use any money for anything else. I mean, it, that it's actually immoral to use any money for anything else, and yet, the only way nonprofits grow, the only way that they succeed, just like businesses, is to invest in making people aware of what they do, and invest in making sure that 
they have the best staff members, that their staff members are paid adequately, that their staff members have health insurance. I mean, all of you in the room who are fellows know that one of the things that we require of the nonprofits you work with is that they provide you with health insurance. And you may all be thinking like, oh, big hairy deal. You know, I had health insurance when I was in college. The thing is, that's correct. But when you move into the nonprofit sector on your own, you'll discover how many of these agencies which are concerned with the well-being of the entire community cannot be bothered to be concerned with the well-being of their staff members. This is another aspect of limited resources. These are not bad people, obviously. They're people who don't have any money. And the first thing I discovered when I moved into the nonprofit sector, I was the executive director of the Chicago Children's Choir. And that is the most hilarious thing you will hear tonight. <laughs> Since I, you know, I don't like children or choral <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. I can no longer remember why. But the, the first thing that I discovered, it, now I'm, I've lost my train of thought. I hate when that happens. It was so important. Well, I'll come back to it somehow. What could I possibly have been saying? Okay. Don't have enough money. Treating staff badly. Treating staff badly. Thank you. I knew you were back for me. Okay. Uh, what I discovered is that, and this is why we have Eric here. Uh, we have uh, uh, nonprofit organizations don't have financial capital, so they use up human capital. And they really do. Burnout is an enormous problem in the nonprofit sector, not only among volunteers on the boards, and that's also true, but among staff members. And that, again, is because the people who work in nonprofits, and all of you, you know, are now in this category, are people who are committed to getting something done. And it seems as though the last thing you should be concerned about is your own convenience, opportunity to take vacation, <coughs> paycheck, and you will hear a lot from people in the business community, not from people in nonprofits, who say, well, you don't go into the nonprofit sector to get rich. This is true. Everybody agrees this is true. But that's not the same thing as saying that going into the nonprofit community ought to cost you health insurance or the opportunity to send your children to college. This is a systemic issue. I don't expect anybody in this room to fix it. I just want you all to be aware of it. Because for a long time, it's been considered acceptable to underpay and undervalue people in nonprofits. And gradually, people are becoming aware that this is a specialized area of skill. If you're a teacher, you need to be paid. If you're a social worker, you need to be paid. The um, areas of the nonprofit community where that is, is actually coming into effect, and you look at it and you think, that's a sensible business practice are the areas where there is for-profit competition. So the hospitals pay doctors and nurses reasonably. Nurses, really not so well, but you know better than they used to. Because there are plenty of for-profit hospitals that will pay them more. The universities pay mo most of their staffs reasonably, saving your presence, of course. <laughs> um, because there are other institutions to which high-level managerial talent can go. On the other hand, the uh, arts community is kind of the arts community. There are certainly, you know, there are for-profit theaters, but they constitute, you know, one-eighth of one percent of the arts that are generated in this country. And since the arts community has no competition at all, when we went this year to talk to theaters and music organizations and even museums about taking UC Pitt Fellows, what they said is $28,000. We don't pay our executive director that much. So this is a community where people are prepared to accept nothing for the privilege of doing the work. My old union organizer self says the hell with that noise. Don't, don't prepare, don't, don't be prepared to be undervalued. Now, how does any of this apply to you? Probably none of it does. Smart people newly arrived in the nonprofit sector, and I will put all of our UC PIP fellows in that category. Smart people newly arrived in the sector have a hard time adjusting their ideas to this level of scarcity. And I'm not sure how many of you have already had this experience. You take a look at something and your analytical skills are very strong and you say, my God, this is an idiotic way to do this. 
And you spend a lot of time saying, why do we do it this way, and why do we do it this way, and why do we do it this way? And you are often treated as though what you're doing is challenging the validity rather than attempting to increase the efficiency of the work that you're doing. But I have to tell you the hardest thing for me to learn as I came into the, what I call the poverty nonprofit sector when I went to work at the Chicago Children's Choir is that change needs to come slowly because you're dealing with people who are getting their compensation emotionally rather than financially. That, by the way, can lead to some really, really sick stuff, and I hope that none of you are encountering that. But it is true that there are environments, really toxic environments, in the nonprofit sector where because people are getting paid badly, they think they're entitled to brutalize their subordinates. Or because people are getting paid badly, they think they're entitled to take time off whenever they want to. Or because they're volunteers and they're not getting, getting paid at all, they think that their compensation should be the opportunity to tell people, the opportunity to tell people who know a lot more about this stuff than they do, what to do. All of those things interfere with the operation of nonprofits. And now that I've told you all this, you must be thinking, I can't believe we operate at all. And it really is a miracle that the nonprofit community operates at all. And it does because of the dedication and smarts of people like you. It does because, although it sounds like a joke, it is an enormous challenge, and people like enormous challenges. People like you like making a difference in the world. The reason I do the work that I do is that I came to quickly to realize how few nonprofit organizations are run by people with management backgrounds. They're run by ballet dancers if they're ballet companies. They're run by teachers if they're schools. They're run by social workers if they're social service agencies. And all of those are very important skills, and those are the perspectives you need to have the mission and vision for an operating nonprofit. But unfortunately, those are not necessarily the skills you need to make sure that the withholding taxes are paid every month and that you're not in trouble with the IRS. And so what I do is wander around from one small agency to another saying, look, don't do what you're doing right now because I did that. And it was a terrible idea. Do this instead. You know, I've already made all the mistakes in the nonprofit sector that can possibly be made. So, you know, I go see people and they say, well, you know, we didn't really think the IRS would notice if we didn't remit. <laughs> you think I'm making this up. If we didn't remit the withholding taxes that we take out of our employees' paychecks to the IRS, they'll never notice. We're just a little teeny weeny nonprofit. And I get to say, yeah, I ran a little teeny weeny nonprofit whose uh, bank account was levied for failure to remit the withholding taxes for five years, $100,000, which of course became $120,000 because of the interest and penalties that go with that. Now, everybody at every nonprofit organization doesn't need to know every one of those details, but let me assure you that somebody at every nonprofit organization needs to know that needs to know that a tax, being a 501c3 organization, which entitles people to give you contributions and get a tax deduction for it, is not the same thing as being a property tax exempt institution, and that there are two different standards for those things. And again, you may think, how could anybody not know? Lots of people don't know that. Every theater company that ever bought a building thinking, God, it's got to be cheaper to own our own building than to you know, pay rent to this greedy landlord, and then discovered that it had to demonstrate its um, qualification for tax exemption on the building, has said to itself, why didn't somebody tell me that tax exempt doesn't mean tax exempt doesn't mean tax exempt? Meanwhile, nothing stays the same. The nonprofit sector changes very rapidly, at least in part, because it is um, run by government policies. It's very highly regulated, and it should be. I'm not an anti-regulatory person. But the regulations change quite frequently. Last year is the first year that small nonprofits, really tiny nonprofits, you know, like this big, had to file um, a tax return. 
Well, there are plenty of people who simply didn't know that. You know, th these are people who don't look in the paper and think, I wonder what's happening in the nonprofit sector right now. They don't read the business pages to see what the IRS is doing. They are social workers and ballet dancers and so on. And then they get a nasty note from the Internal Revenue Service that says, guess what? The tax-deductible 501c3 status that you have enjoyed has just been revoked. And then the world comes to an end, right? Because nobody can give them any money, or rather people can give them money, they just can't get a tax deduction for it. Other things that change, and this is one that's going to come down like a 900-pound hammer on probably every hospital and every university is that local governments, which don't have enough money, I mean, they really don't have a pot to piss in, and it's not just Chicago, and it's not just Illinois, it is nationwide, and are having a very hard time increasing taxes, even though they desperately need to. Local governments have looked around and said, oh my goodness, look at all this tax-exempt property. Look at all the property the University of Chicago sits on. Look at all the property the University of Chicago hospitals sit on. Look at all the property the YMCA's sit on. Why don't those people pay us for the public services we provide? We provide them with police services and fire services and water. Water! The YMCA is essentially a health club. Anybody <laughs> who provides them with water is providing them with a lot of, of value. And so the next thing that's going to happen is nonprofits are going to be challenged on whether they are, in fact, for local tax purposes, charities. Because I have a tendency to use the term nonprofit and charity interchangeably, but the truth of the fact of the matter is they're not at all interchangeable. There are charities which give services away or provide services at incredible discounts. And then there are little teeny weeny <laughs> struggling nonprofits like the National Football League and the American Bar Association and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. <laughs> so there are going to be, uh, there, there have already been court cases that hold that uh, hospitals that do not provide an adequate amount of free care will lose their tax exemptions. There's a court case working its way through the Cook County system right now about whether a senior, um, uh, a retirement community, a, a luxury retirement community on the near north side called the, um, what is that damn thing called? It's on the Gold Coast. I mean, it's really, it's like across the street from Watertown. It's very body da Sorry? Bernardin. Yeah. Is whether this, which is, you know, a luxury accommodation, is a charity. Now, currently, senior citizens' homes are charities, but that's not necessarily going to stay the same. So if you were the executive director of your nonprofit instead of merely a staff member, these are the things that would be buffeting you all the time. And the challenges that you would face would be to identify where threats are coming from and at the same time identify where opportunities are. All of you who have been through strategic planning processes or who have heard your agencies talk about them, talk about SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And, you know, that's a little formulaic for me. That's not the way I do strategic planning. But it is true that if you don't keep your eye on what the market needs your agency to do, then you're going to find yourselves uh, unable to attract support. Now, let me explain what I mean by the market in this case. And this, again, is another thing that's unique about nonprofits. Any for-profit agency that identifies a huge and growing market makes a lot of money, right? Because every person that they serve is a profit center. That's what they do. Every nonprofit that identifies a huge and growing market like homeless people, or people who don't have enough food, or homeless kids who have no place to go to school, they have identified a loss center. So anytime anybody tells you, I don't understand why nonprofits don't operate you know, like businesses, this is why. Because our bottom line is actually different. And every time we identify another area of people we can serve, we identify an opportunity to lose a lot of money. <laughs> and you know what? That's what we're for. There's a lot of talk, and you guys have probably heard this as well, about social entrepreneurship. This is the new buzz phrase in the nonprofit community. And it's a fantasy that really, if nonprofits just identify 
something that they could sell, that they could underwrite all the things that they give away. And so, you know, women's shelters find themselves starting businesses to make soap. And uh, job development organizations create factories to build um, uh, uh, blinds for windows. And neither of those, by the way, is something I'm making up. These are actual things. And the problem is that running a business is one set of skills, and running a nonprofit is another. If organizations succeed, in running these for-profit businesses that are supposed to subsidize their nonprofits, they very quickly discover that he who has the gold makes the rules. And so that the people who are able to produce all of that money that's supposed to underwrite the nonprofit, those are the people with the major pull about what happens in the nonprofit. And so suddenly you have people whose primary concern is making money, making the decision about organizations whose primary job is to give it away. This, needless to say, produces some tension. So I don't think social entrepreneurship is, is a cure-all. I think people who are under the impression that nonprofits could be self-supporting if they just looked in the right places are having a fantasy about how we can support the most vulnerable people in our society without spending any money on it, without making it difficult. There's another version of this that you've probably encountered online probably every 15 minutes on your Facebook page, somebody comes on and says, here's the Pepsi challenge, and if you vote for this nonprofit, it'll get $5,000. So send all your friends notes that say, vote for us in the Pepsi challenge. Pepsi gets, I would guess, a million dollars worth of publicity for giving $5,000 away to some organization. Now, there are people who claim that if your organization is just <coughs> virtuous enough, that you will be sustained by things like the Pepsi Challenge. And no one will ever actually have to reach into her pocket and hand you any money. This is nonsense. The whole nonprofit sector depends on generosity. So that you know, segues me into the next thing. How do we secure generosity? It's very easy if you're in the nonprofit community to get furious at anybody who's not. And probably you can all hear my undertones or overtones of that. There are, it's hard to work in a community that doesn't seem to value what you want. And so you need to spend a lot of time, if you're in the nonprofit sector, talking to the community. And then, of course, your next reasonable question is, what is the community? The community is not just the people that you serve. It's all the people who are benefited by the fact that you serve them. Now, what that means is virtually any nonprofit can make an appeal to virtually any person because all of us benefit if there are fewer people sleeping on the streets. And all of us benefit if Chicago has a vibrant cultural life and all the theaters survive. But in the real world, there are always going to be an inner circle of people who benefit profoundly from what you do. Those are your community. If you're you know, serving a particular geographic area, it's the business people immediately around you, it's the residents immediately around you, it's the citizenry. If you're serving a particular kind of person, it's other people or their parents or their siblings or whatever who are affected by whatever that client population needs. So of course, you know, the Susan G. G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation raises all its money from survivors and family members of survivors. That's the community. And I guess I would argue for all of you, as you're thinking about what you want to do next in the nonprofit sector, is to think about what community you want to be in, what community you want to serve, what community you want to talk to. Because, you know, it is funny in retrospect that I went to work for an organization that did two things I didn't give a lesser crap about. But you don't want to do that. It is a very different thing to ask people to support an agency that you love than to ask people to support an agency that you understand is valuable. I understood that the Chicago Children's Choir was incredibly valuable, and without any difficulty, I could tell you why. But I couldn't bring to it the passion and the fire that's necessary, because really, whether it's, it's getting people to know what your organization is, or getting them to support it with money, or getting them to support it with advocacy in Springfield, saying, 
uh, you know, we need more money for charter schools here in Chicago, whatever it might be. All of that is a matter of individuals lighting each other on fire. And so I'm going to stop right there. There are probably eight gazillion things that I could say more. Actually, there's one, there's one thing I will say as the last thing, and then I want to take questions and comments. The last thing is we have a society, because the nonprofit sector is so important, we have a society where the most important work of our entire society educating people, feeding hungry people, housing homeless people, providing the arts, protecting the environment. We have a society where that is done entirely by organizations run by amateurs. And what I mean by that is not, you know, the ballet dancer running the ballet company. What I mean by that is every nonprofit organization, as I think all of you know, is run by a volunteer board of directors. Well, the boards of directors of for-profit agencies get paid to show up at meetings and not pay any attention to what's going on. Uh, ask Jim Thompson about that, right? He just kind of <laughs> let things go by. But the boards of directors of nonprofit organizations not only are not paid for their volunteer time, but they're expected to pay for the privilege. Everybody who sits on a nonprofit board is expected to write checks to support that nonprofit, is expected to pick the pockets of their friends to support that nonprofit. And in a way, that's a wonderful thing because those board members are the community. They are the representatives of the community. Their job, their, their legal job, is to make sure that the agency is doing the thing for which it gets its tax deduction. They are making sure that charity is actually being practiced and not some uh, fraud. And I'm sorry to say, of course, that there is fraud in the nonprofit community, although less than in the for-profit community because you don't steal from people who don't have any money. It's just easier to steal from people who are rich. So there's <laughs> less of it. Um, but the consequence of that is that if you have a nonprofit agency that's very professionally run, that has brought in you know, somebody who's knowledgeable about nonprofits and knowledgeable about fundraising and is operating the business in a way that is essentially ideal for the provision of that service, that's a person who has to answer to a group of between 12 and 25 people who hardly know anything about either the business or the agency and has to spend a lot of time explaining him herself to those amateurs. And it's easy to think, what a stupid system. How could we have set up a system where amateurs get to decide what happens? And the answer is, we believe that the provision of important services is a matter of, of the voluntary spirit of the American people. And since I'm talking to a room full of UFC people, I know you all read Tocqueville. None of this is news. The American system has been to rely on voluntary organizations, and we continue to do so. They become more elaborated and more complicated. Their relationship with government on the one hand and institutional funders like the MacArthur Foundation on the other hand gets more complicated and difficult. What they're up against, obviously the social challenges they face, change all the time. But the nonprofit sector is, I would argue, the essential American sector. And so it's up to us to grapple with its challenges and solve its problems.